jousting. The very word conjures up magical imagery of two noble knights dueling for glory. But that's only in fairy tales and history books, right? The original sport of kings is new to this country, and Australians are wasting no time in catching up with the rest of the world. Two armoured horsemen charge towards each other, lances angled to strike and land the winning blow. It's a game. There can only be one tournament champion. Points are crucial, skill essential, courage a necessity. Jousting is a sport of potentially fatal courage. centuries, this sport has drawn some of the best and bravest horsemen from the Western world to compete for victory. Today, while kings no longer compete, tournaments are still held across the world in countries such as the United States, France, England, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand and here in Australia. Despite the sport's recent arrival on these shores, it has already gained a strong following of committed competitors and dedicated fans. Well, I first became interested in jousting, I think, as a, as a kid. I mean, everybody, most kids dress up as a cowboy or a knight or an astronaut. I think I did all of those. Well, as a kid, everybody wants to be knight. And when you see, saw the Ivanhoe, you get more winded up and wanted to be more knight. It's a kid's dream to be a knight. <laughs> I was riding from a very young age. Um, as a child, very interested in knights, as a lot of kids do and just sort of never grew out of it. Well, for me, it's a combination of extreme sport and culture. My family in the distant past would have participated in jousting, so the cultural and the um, heritage roots are there for me. And it's a good excuse to smash things on other people without actually hurting them too much while they do the same to me. You get to uh, play a sport with people fr from your country and afar, uh, where you get to really take some fairly large risks with horse sports and um, armour and weapons with people that you admire uh, and who are really quite strong. It's just things that we do when we're kids, we pick these things up and we run at each other and that childhood dream sort of I suppose never goes away and some people just as they get older progress it into a hobby so you've got people worldwide doing jousting demonstrations or tournaments. Jousting is a sport and like every sport it has rules. The field with two lanes is called the tilt, down which jousters ride. This led to the saying, going full tilt. Points are scored by breaking a lance. A lance broken in two is worth two points. A lance shattered into multiple parts is worth three. For a hit to count, a jouster's lance must be broken on the torso or shield of their opponent. Imagine, you're riding a 500 kilo horse at 40 kilometres an hour while wearing 40 kilograms of armour. Your aim is to try and hit a moving target with an eight foot stick. Good luck with that. When I'm sitting in, uh, in the end of the run and I get my lance and ju I just focus on where I'm gonna hit on the shield. So, and when you see the other opponent uh, raise the lance, and you let go and you're just starting to focus really hard on that um, that place you're gonna hit and you can't hear you can't see anything else except for the place you aim for that's the only thing you're thinking of i'm just focusing exactly where on a hit There's nothing else for me matters at that point but where I'm going to put my lance. The entire world uh, disappears and all I'm focused on is my target, the, the spot on them that I want to hit. The first of two tournaments that will be featured in this program are held every year in the small town of Lithgow. 
Nestled amongst the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, the St George's Day tournament has attracted crowds of up to 15,000 spectators. This year, crowds have braved the freezing temperatures and gale force winds to watch jousters from around the world compete for the title of tournament champion. Competing in his first international tournament is Philip Oliver, or Ollie to his mates. In true Aussie style, he wants to have a go, purely for the chance to experience this extreme sport. He began training under the expert guidance of Rod and Michelle Walker, both veterans of the international jousting circuit. Uh, Philip's been jousting with us for, for six months and he's just a natural at it. We um, offered for him to come along to a show and help us out uh, and we've been continually just working on his Lance presentation and, and the little things but um, and, you know, every now and then you get somebody come along who's very good and uh, just picks it up very easily and he, he concentrates and he wants to be safe so he's um, because he listens to everything that you say he's gone through the process a lot faster than anybody normally would. What I've done in the past is total left field to the jousting, um, show riding and show jumping um, but this is an excitement horse sport as I call it, not so much reenactment for me, but horse sport. We've got Philip on the field for the first time this year. This is his first tournament. He's facing seven other fully qualified international jousters, and that's going to be good. He's, he's from what I've seen, he's nice and clean, and he's certainly ready for the tournament, which will be good to see him. And at Rod and Michelle always put on a good, good competitive event, so it should be a lot of fun. To be taking part in this tournament is uh, first and foremost not only an honour uh, but a privilege to compete against you know uh, the best jousters around the world. I think he'll do very well. He's, uh, we've been giving him a lot of instruction along the way and we've taken him to an event where he did get to joust somebody other than myself and Rodney, which was one of his biggest fears coming into the tournament, was facing the other riders that had a lot of experience. I'm going to get nailed. That, no doubt about that whatsoever, but that's part of the part of the fun. Phil's been riding all his life. He's a very good rider. We gave him some training. Uh, this is about again, geez, eight months ago, I suppose. He um, he was hooked. Never wanted to joust and had a go at it, and he's been hooked ever since. He's just devoted pretty much all his time now to the joust. I think what's what set a lot of people back is that I am 49 this year, um, and most of these people are very young. They're athletic, like they're over six foot tall. I'm, you know, five foot nothing and 65 kilos ring and wet. And um, once again, I think it's a typical Aussie spirit that, yeah, I'm going to have a go. Um, no matter how hard it might seem or feel, just have a go. Bit of spirit about you. Well, you've often probably heard the expression, you know, um, earning, the sp earning your spurs. Uh, and that dates back to when knighthood was first uh, you know, first kicked off in the 11th century. A knight would earn his spurs, a young squire, uh, after a period of training, would earn his spurs. Um, so, I mean, we haven't mentioned it to Phil, didn't want to put any more pressure on him, but, uh, you know, this event, I mean, shows are one thing, tournaments are a completely different animal. So, really, for Phil, um, and I imagine he feels it too, you know, this could be really earning his spurs. Phil's first match is up against Petter Ellingsen of Norway, a joust veteran with 15 years experience. The best of three passes will decide the winner of the round. After two passes, the results are tied. The atmosphere is tense. The next pass will decide the winner. A hit for Phil, a miss for Petter. A great result for the newcomer. Petter and I were even on the two, the two runs we had, uh, even points. Um, coming down the last one, and um, you look at it, you go, well, what do you got? What do you got, Patter? And I'm thinking to myself, well, man, we've been um, cussing and cursing you all the last two days. I've got to show you some stuff, so just dug a bit deeper and just nailed him. Well, I missed, so I wanted the Ollie too much. <laughs> Despite his jubilation, Phil knows he is yet to face the remaining six jousters, including his teacher, three times world champion Rod Walker. Traditionally, jousting in the medieval era was a man's sport. However, modern jousting events in most parts of the world allow male and female jousters to compete against each other. Unlike rugby and boxing, where female-only competitions are held, jousting is a sport where men and women compete as equals. With adrenaline pumping and the hits coming hard and fast, the risk of injury for competitors is great. If you're a lady today and you want to joust, you must be willing to joust with the men and take the hits that the men are going to give you. So you need to be pretty confident 
in your abilities to go out there and face them, because some of them are pretty big. As a female facing the Australian jousting circuit, I felt early on in the piece that I needed to be particularly good. I was particularly quiet about being a female in the sport. I didn't tell the media because it, it, I, it, I felt like it would attract more attention to me and unnecessarily when there's better competitors out there. But as I felt it gotten better, more equal on the field, um, that I, I'm much more comfortable to expose the fact that there's females out there. As a woman in the sport of jousting, I haven't had any resistance in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US. There is resistance in England. They won't let women joust in England. There's also some resistance in a few other countries. I've also jousted in Norway and Sweden. There is no resistance with women jousting in those countries, but there are a few out there that strictly say no, no women. No women originally jousted, so no women are allowed to joust now. So, which is quite difficult for the women that, that desperately want to travel the world and, and joust in tournaments. There's no difference between the guys and the girls that do this. The girls out there know exactly what they're coming up against and most of them get angry if you try to pull back. So it's, it's the kind of thing where you, you want to hit them as hard as you can and they want to hit you as hard as you can. But they're one of the guys. It's, it's just the way it is. There was, again, a duty of care as a female competitor not to make the sport look weak. If there's a whole field of women competitors in Australia, the public perception tends to be that this is just playing around. So I needed to be very careful to not um, change the public perception of the strength of the sport. So I, I was, but I am quite a strong person. I've always done physical labour. Um, I'm certainly not slight. And I, over the years, it's just gone away. The issue in Australia. Nobody takes it easy on anyone. If they step into the tilt, if they're in the in harness running the joust, then they're going to get hit, and they know that. And we've got some tough women. Um, we've got some, you know, and they're not manly women either. <laughs> I mean, I think the respect is you're a jouster, whether you be male, or female. Um, you've got enough guts to do it. Um, and once again, you, whoever's at the other end of the list doesn't matter. You're still going to hit them as hard as you can, whether you're female or male, and, and, and they're going to do the same. Jousting is a contact sport, and like rugby league, AFL and boxing, injuries can happen, even when wearing full armour to protect themselves. A British jouster was killed in 2007 when a lance pierced his eye through his visor. Jousters are faced with the very fact that their sport can result in permanent injury or death, despite their lances being designed to break cleanly. I have broken my hand once and, and torn off one of my pictorial muscles. I have seen guys just knocked out on their horses from the impact, the concussive impact through the armour, um, just knocking them out. I've had armour torn off me, but as far as injuries go, bruising is the extent. Uh, or wrist injuries. Wrist injuries are very common, but you kind of do that to yourself. If you hit someone particularly hard and the timber doesn't give away, something's got to go, and it's often your wrist. I've been hit, groin shots are, are the worst, the, the most common. I've had um, dinner plate sized bruises in the groin region from uh, low lances. I caught two lance blows off the shield. They, they bounce off my shield and got these either side. This is the two hits in a row, and uh, one lance broke, broke the shield, broke the tip, and went that side of, of the middle peg. And then the second pass later, the other one went that side, and the bruising was fair income, probably that big. Um, but um, yeah, just the way the lance hit, it just snapped down and then went down. So. Um, after that I've been wearing a box, a cricket box, I'm thinking, well, I've got to protect some bits. Um, all the guys are laughing about it, but I went, nah, seriously, that hurt? And I took a hit straight into the crotch, uh, and I mean, that one, that one nearly killed me. I, um, I nearly bled out on the field. Um, you know, paramedics off to hospital the whole lot, uh, stitched stitch back together. Jousting two weeks again, two weeks later. The world of medieval mayhem creates a select group, bound together by their passion for their sport. Despite language barriers and cultural differences, friendships are forged that last a lifetime. You're having to trust the other person implicitly with your life because in the joust, 
you can get badly hurt if the other person makes a mistake. So there's a huge amount of trust in your opponent and, uh, and when, you're, when you're jousting each other, it's for real, you're serious about it, but there's also the utmost respect and, um, and afterwards it's um, you know, that shared experience and that shared camaraderie which is, uh, you probably have done uh, military service to get the same kind of uh, you know, depth of feeling to other people. Uh, the friendship and the bond between the knights and the people around, the squires, uh, the organizers, everything, is a very tight bond. And you, you get to know a lot of new friends and uh, you meet friends you've, you've made, up, made from being at tournaments for a long time. And it's, it's a kind of, like, it's difficult to explain that kind of, of, of friendship because what you're doing is you're, you're sitting up on a horse with, with 10 to 12 foot of lance trying to ram your opponent as hard as you can and then you go off have a beer later. The many different characters that are involved in the sport keep it really interesting. You have professionals and policemen and doctors and uh, vets and you also have the struggling artists. So, and that all creates a really strong camaraderie. It equalizes through the sport, so it's very strong. The more that you talk to these guys, they're not braggers. You know, they're, they're just genuine, uh, genuine sort of guys coming from overseas to take part in a sport that they love dearly. Um, They've got the passion for the sport. It is essential that a jouster has full control of his horse for him to be successful in the tilt. This means great horsemanship is required before a jouster can even consider competing. It's left field for a lot of um, horse orientated sports or, or what we do in Australia. You'll find, you know, people are into cutting, um, camp draft, show jumping. This sort of thing is total left field for any, any horse enthusiast. It's just way out there. That's one of the fun things about the sport is it's not just about yourself it's about also working with another living being a horse because if the horse isn't happy the horse isn't going to play coming over here to the states canada you can get like cutting horses western horses uh, god knows what <laughs> different type of horses so you need to build up a trust and, and a feel with the horse and just instead of trying to educate an already different educated horse just go go with the flow and, and let the horse do what what it's supposed to do. Most horses you get to borrow have done this before, so they know what they're supposed to do and uh, instead of trying to force them into all sorts of different types of riding styles, you just learn to go with the flow and learn to ride with the horse. It's very important that the horses are all well trained, calm and the riders get along with them, otherwise they're going to have a terrible tournament. <laughs> Some riders have the opportunity to ride their own horse. Talizian has brought her Andalusian stallion, Fenris. Weighing 800 kilograms, he is easily the largest horse in the tournament. Riding their own horse is an advantage, one that competitors will take whenever the opportunity arises. Not only do they need to have a strong bond with their horse, these skilled riders must keep their mounts in the same condition as themselves. This requires training the horses to unflinchingly charge at their opponents, whilst being able to respond to the slightest commands from their rider. You need to ensure that your horse is well fit, because if he's not fit, he will be quite uncomfortable on the field. You need to be fit yourself. If the horse doesn't want to do it, then we don't make them do it. But it's just basically getting the horse to listen to you and to accept what you're doing so you know what each other's trying to achieve. Becoming a jouster with the skill to hit a small target at high speed from horseback requires great focus and hand-eye coordination. A competitor must be able to strike with impressive accuracy in order to score and avoid causing his opponent serious injury. A jouster must undertake a rigorous training regime in order to be match ready. Lithgow tournament organisers Rod and Michelle Walker have trained a number of jousters over the years, including Philip Oliver. They mainly concentrate not on your horsemanship, but your hand-eye coordination. Um, what they show you is technique. Um, they have not got the time to show you how to ride. Um, they show you basic technique and, and how to joust. The main thing that we try to get through to people is you must have minimum two years riding experience and be able to use your seat and legs to be able to control the horse. We then go through skills on the horse with sword cuts, how to use your sword, the best way to pick up the rings, to hit the quintain. A lot of it is just repetition, building that eye-hand coordination and building the reflexes so you can see what's going on in the time it goes. A pass is very, very quick. It's only a few seconds from end to end, so you've got a fraction of a second really 
on the point where you can drop your lance to hit your opponent and if you can't think quick enough you're not going to be able to see them and you'll generally miss them. At the end of the tournament when all points have been tallied it's Joram Vanessen of New Zealand who is made champion of the tournament followed by Rod Walker and Justin Holland on equal second. On equal third Petter shares his place with the newcomer Phil Oliver. In the beginning the internationals were calling him the grey rabbit but they soon discovered this grey rabbit can hit very hard. Phil Oliver has finally earned his spurs. To earn the spurs, um, yeah, it's just an exciting part of a nine-month journey, I guess. It's it's the road to the end of the path, maybe, or the journey is um, a fulfilling one. With that, to earn spurs, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a uh, it's pretty freaky. Phil rose to the challenge and claimed his spurs in a successful bid to be part of the jousting community. As a result, he received an invitation to the Abbey Medieval Festival, one of Queensland's premier tournaments on the jousting calendar. Talizian, however, was not as happy with her result on the field at Lithgow, though she too is set to compete at Abbey. The point scoring in Lithgow was fairly average actually. I scored quite low considering the um, points that I could have gotten. Um, I believe I only scored 12 and I, it was out of a good 64 or perhaps more that I was able to get. So those averages are pretty bad. Um, you can only ride on the fact that a horse is in training for so long. So I expect that my points will improve dramatically at Abbey. If they don't, I need to go back to the training field and work a lot harder. The Abbey tournament is Queensland's largest medieval festival, attracting up to 30,000 spectators. This year, the jousting tournament will have eight competitors, four men, four women. For Talizzi and Bleachmore, it will be a homecoming of sorts after competing in Europe between Lithgow and Abbey. It's been a couple of years since I've ridden um, Abbey locally. It is my home ground. I get to train a lot of the people who um, hopefully get to compete in such a close um, tournament. You're really excited to be in Abbey. Um, never thought it'd be as this big, but it's, it's humongous. You know, the, the, uh, looking around the place, looking at the stalls, it's just so big. I've never been to an event as big as this ever. The Abbey site compared to Lithgow is much more pleasing to the eye. Um, and it also has a, a really large uh, medieval festival that's quite exclusively medieval. They have control of their environment in a, a, a different way than Lithgow is able to. So um, uh, it, they'll be good tournaments. They're both really nice tournaments. But as for the jousting and uh, competition, really nothing much has changed as far as I'm, I'm aware. Anyway, I've got a big head or anything after Lithgow because it's uh, all learning curves and it's all every day is a different day. I'm looking forward to having much better outcome at Abbey. The best I've ever done at Abbey is third. I'd like to at least do that this year. The Abbey Festival has a little surprise for the jousters this year. One of the competitors is known only as Dashwarza Ritter, the Black Knight. In medieval times, a knight would wear black in an effort to remain anonymous on the battlefield. This mystery jouster is already causing a stir amongst competitors and spectators alike, in particular our newly ranked jouster, Philip Oliver. And as luck would have it, I've actually drawn the Black Knight for the first event. So, you know, I don't know what to expect. The Black Knight enters the field with a colourful entourage, heralding his challenge to the other competitors. It is said he jousts for honour, but the crowd believes otherwise. The Grey Rabbit, Philip Oliver, bravely takes up the lance once more to face this mystery foe. The first go, well, was against the Black Knight. Um, and even before going into the list, I was, you know, shit scared, obviously not knowing exactly what to expect. Uh, the first pass, they hit me like a, a freight train. And I'm thinking, oh, I felt that before from a few people, but yeah, it hit me pretty hard, shoot me up a little bit. The mystery knight was just as ruthless with his other opponents, and his identity continued to remain a secret as the tournament progressed. This year's Abbey tournament has proven to be particularly intense, with the dangers inherent in this extreme sport laid bare for all to see. The accident that caused many a spectator to squirm in their seats occurred between Australia's Justin Holland and New Zealand's Jez Smith, when they both simultaneously struck each other in the crutch. It could be said the Australia-New Zealand rivalry had truly hit an all-time low. Got a chunk torn out of my thumb, um, a lance hit a shield and then came in and hit my hand and I got hit in the crotch and that's hurting more. The one piece of equipment I couldn't bring from New Zealand because of the weight allowance that were given because my whole armour normally weighs 20 kgs but you add another 3 kgs of 
a chainmail skirt on which actually protects the old man and the family jewels. And um, I didn't bring it and I suffered for the consequences. Well, I hope I haven't suffered for the consequences. I've got to go and check that in a minute, thank you. No, I'm going to have to go and dangle something in a bucket of water just now to see if I can get the swelling down and it won't be my hand. It's the lower part of my body. Meanwhile, the successful Lithgow rookie, Phil Oliver, has also been having a less than ideal tournament here at Abbey. I really didn't perform that well in relationship with the horse. I let the horse down, so to speak. I didn't ride the horse well enough. Um, so I had to concentrate on riding the horse more so than jousting, which uh, let the horse and myself down. Phil continued to struggle with his performance, placing fourth on both days of the Abbey Tournament. For a 49-year-old man from Sydney with less than a year's jousting experience, Phil's journey has been nothing short of remarkable. For jouster to Lizzie and Bleachmore, her goal of improving her result at Lithgow is becoming a reality, with only the recovered Jez Smith to beat. Got to go through to the final, which was against Jez Smith, and I beat him. <laughs> Yay! Following her win on Saturday, to Lizzie and placed second on Sunday after facing off against Jez Smith once more and losing on the final pass. Her two podium finishes at this year's Abbey Tournament have by far exceeded her result at the Lithgow Tournament earlier in the year. Also on the podium is our mystery Black Knight. But who was this unknown jouster? For this event I snuck into the tournament as uh, Die Schwarze Ritter, the, the Black Knight. So um, it took a little bit of uh, shenanigans but yeah. It was fun doing the, the Black Knight thing. Yeah, the mongrel. First hit that I had, well, I felt very familiar, if I can, you know, coin the phrase, and was um, obviously the master. Um, and once again, um, just proves a, beyond a shadow of a doubt, whatever form he takes, he just hits your heart. Um, technique, technique, technique. After two days of passionate and sometimes painful competition, the Abbey Tournament finally draws to a close. Over the course of two tournaments, these competitors have proven that jousting is truly an extreme sport, unlike any other this country has seen. This full contact sport where men and women compete together and underdogs can triumph is deservedly enjoying a resurgence around the world. Philip Oliver and Talisian Bleachmore are just two among a group of passionate Australians rising to the challenge of this extreme sport. It's always a proud moment to represent your country. Uh, th this isn't a really big sport. We're hoping it to be, but always being out there knowing that you're the only one representing your country puts both pride and pressure. You don't want to come back and say, oh, I screwed up. You, you want to do the best for your country, and, it, and it's, it's a boost as well. You're representing Norway, your own country, and that's, that's a good thing. When I'm running down the tilt, and we're, we're, we've all done all the hard work to get onto the field, and you're facing your opponent down the tilt, everything else becomes quiet. You're, you have a silence about you, and you see a target in front of you, and if you can smoothly get to there without um, any other distractions, you're going to have a good match. It's a really quiet, almost zen moment. To, to have a good run down the tilt. Representing Australia is, is anybody's dream, isn't it? Whatever sport or thing you do. This is like Formula One racing. You know, this is, this, is, this is what this is to me. Formula One racing, not everybody can do this sort of thing. And to actually represent your country um, is a major honour. It is a global culture. Um, everybody looks after everybody. You go away to an event and you don't have to solely look after your horse yourself or you know try and have one squire look after you everybody pitches in and helps everybody out so it's a fantastic sport that way we're all friends we're all mates um, and uh, I think I think I've said it before you know you want your best friend to smash the bejesus out of you um, and you want to smash the bejesus out of him it's um, you know grab your arm grab your lance travel to faraway lands um, you know make friends and smash them with a big stick
requires training the horses to unflinchingly charge at their opponents whilst being able to respond to the slightest commands from their rider. You need to ensure that your horse is well fit because if he's not fit he would be quite uncomfortable on the field. You need to be fit yourself. If the horse doesn't want to do it, then we don't make them do it. But it's just basically getting the horse to listen to you and to accept what you're doing so you know what each other's trying to achieve. Becoming a jouster with the skill to hit a small target at high speed from horseback requires great focus and hand-eye coordination. A competitor must be able to strike with impressive accuracy in order to score and avoid causing his opponent serious injury. A jouster must undertake a rigorous training regime in order to be match ready. Lithgow tournament organisers Rod and Michelle Walker have trained a number of jousters over the years including Philip Oliver. They mainly concentrate not on your horsemanship but your hand-eye coordination, um, what they show you is technique. Um, they have not got the time to show you how to ride. Um, they show you basic technique and, and how to joust. The main thing that we try to get through to people is you must have minimum two years riding experience and be able to use your seat and legs to be able to control the horse. We then go through skills on the horse with sword cuts, how to use your sword, the best way to pick up the rings, to hit the quintain. A lot of it is just repetition, building that eye-hand coordination and building the reflexes so you can see what's going on in the time it goes. A pass is very, very quick. It's only a few seconds from end to end, so you've got a fraction of a second really on the point where you can drop your lance to hit your opponent. And if you can't think quick enough, you're not going to be able to see them and you'll generally miss them. At the end of the tournament, when all points have been tallied, it's Joram Vanessen of New Zealand who is made champion of the tournament, followed by Rod Walker and Justin Holland on equal second. On equal third, Petter shares his place with the newcomer Phil Oliver. In the beginning, the internationals were calling him the Grey Rabbit, but they soon discovered this Grey Rabbit can hit very hard. Phil Oliver has finally earned his spurs. To earn the spurs, um, yeah, it's just an exciting part of a nine month journey, I guess. It's it's the road to the end of the path maybe, or the journey is um, a fulfilling one with that. To earn spurs, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's pretty freaky. Phil rose to the challenge and claimed his spurs in a successful bid to be part of the jousting community. As a result, he received an invitation to the Abbey Medieval Festival, one of Queensland's premier tournaments on the jousting calendar. Talizian, however, was not as happy with her result on the field at Lithgow, though she too is set to compete at Abbey. The point scoring in Lithgow was fairly average actually. I scored quite low considering the um, points that I could have gotten. Um, I believe I only scored 12 and I, it was out of a good 64 or perhaps more that I was able to get. So those averages are pretty bad. Um, you can only ride on the fact that a horse is in training for so long. So I expect that my points will improve dramatically at Abbey. If they don't, I need to go back to the training field and work a lot harder. The Abbey tournament is Queensland's largest medieval festival, attracting up to 30,000 spectators. This year, the jousting tournament will have eight competitors, four men, four women. For Talizzi and Bleachmore, it will be a homecoming of sorts after competing in Europe between Lithgow and Abbey. It's been a couple of years since I've ridden um, Abbey locally. It is my home ground. I get to train a lot of the people who um, hopefully get to compete in such a close um, tournament. You're really excited to be in Abbey. Um, never thought it'd be as this big, but it's, it's humongous. You know, the, the uh, looking around the place, looking at the stalls, it's just so big. I've never been to an event as big as this ever. The Abbey site compared to Lithgow is much more pleasing to the eye. Um, and it also has a, a ex really large uh, medieval festival that's quite exciting exclusively medieval. They have control of their environment in a, a, a different way than Lithgow is able to. So um, it, it, they'll be good tournaments. They're both really nice tournaments. But as for the jousting and uh, competition really, nothing much has changed as far as I'm, I'm aware anyway. I've got a big head or anything after Lithgow because it's uh, all learning curves and it's all every day is a different day. I'm looking forward to having much better outcome at Abbey. The best I've ever done at Abbey is third. I'd like to at least do that this year. The Abbey Festival has a little surprise for the jousters this year. One of the competitors is known only as Darshwaza Ritter, the Black Knight. 
In medieval times, a knight would wear black in an effort to remain anonymous on the battlefield. This mystery jouster is already causing a stir amongst competitors and spectators alike, in particular our newly ranked jouster, Philip Oliver. As luck would have it, I've actually drawn the black knight for the first event. So, you know, I don't know what to expect. The Black Knight enters the field with a colourful entourage, heralding his challenge to the other competitors. It is said he jousts for honour, but the crowd believes otherwise. The Grey Rabbit, Philip Oliver, bravely takes up the lance once more to face this mystery foe. The first go, well, was against the Black Knight. Um, and even before going into the list, I was, you know, shit scared, obviously not knowing exactly what to expect. Uh, the first pass, they hit me like a, a freight train. And I'm thinking, oh, I felt that before from a few people, but yeah, it hit me pretty hard, shook me up a little bit. The mystery knight was just as ruthless with his other opponents, and his identity continued to remain a secret as the tournament progressed. This year's Abbey tournament has proven to be particularly intense, with the dangers inherent in this extreme sport laid bare for all to see. The accident that caused many a spectator to squirm in their seats occurred between Australia's Justin Holland and New Zealand's Jez Smith, when they both simultaneously struck each other in the crutch. It could be said the Australia-New Zealand rivalry had truly hit an all-time low. I've got a chunk torn out of my thumb, um, a lance hit a shield and then came in and hit my hand, and I got hit in the crotch. And that's hurting more. The one piece of equipment I couldn't bring from New Zealand because of the weight allowance that were given, because my whole armour normally weighs 20 kgs, but you add another 3 kgs of a chainmail skirt on, which actually protects the old man and the family jewels and um, I didn't bring it and I suffered for the consequences. Well I hope I haven't suffered for the consequences, I've got to go and check that in a minute, thank you. No, I'm going to have to go and dangle something in a bucket of water just now to see if I can get the swelling down and it won't be my hand. It's the lower part of my body. Meanwhile, the successful Lithgow rookie, Phil Oliver, has also been having a less than ideal tournament here at Abbey. I really didn't perform that well in relationship with the horse. I let the horse down, so to speak. I didn't ride the horse well enough. Um, so I had to concentrate on riding the horse more so than jousting, which uh, let the horse and myself down. Phil continued to struggle with his performance, placing fourth on both days of the Abbey Tournament. For a 49-year-old man from Sydney, with less than a year's jousting experience, Phil's journey has been nothing short of remarkable. For jouster to Lizzie and Bleachmore, her goal of improving her result at Lithgow is becoming a reality, with only the recovered Jez Smith to beat. Got to go through to the final, which was against Jez Smith, and I beat him. <laughs> Yay! Following her win on Saturday, to Lizzie and placed second on Sunday, after facing off against Jez Smith once more and losing on the final pass. Her two podium finishes at this year's Abbey Tournament have by far exceeded her result at the Lithgow Tournament earlier in the year. Also on the podium is our mystery Black Knight. But who was this unknown jouster? For this event I snuck into the tournament as uh, Die Schwarze Ritter, the, the Black Knight. So um, it took a little bit of uh, shenanigans but yeah. It was fun doing the, the Black Knight thing. Yeah, the mongrel. First hit that I had, well, I felt very familiar, if I can, you know, coin the phrase, and was um, obviously the master. Um, and once again, um, just proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt, whatever form he takes, he just hits your heart. Um, technique, technique, technique. After two days of passionate and sometimes painful competition, the Abbey Tournament finally draws to a close. Over the course of two tournaments, these competitors have proven that jousting is truly an extreme sport, unlike any other this country has seen. This full contact sport where men and women compete together and underdogs can triumph is deservedly enjoying a resurgence around the world. Philip Oliver and Talisian Bleachmore are just two among a group of passionate Australians rising to the challenge of this extreme sport. It's always a proud moment to represent your country. Uh, this, this isn't a really big sport. We're hoping it to be, but always being out there knowing that you're the only one representing your country puts both pride and pressure. You don't want to come back and say, uh, I screwed up. You, you want to do the best for your country and, and it's, it's a boost as well. You're representing Norway, your own country, and that's, that's a good thing. 
When I'm running down the tilt and we're, we're, we've all done all the hard work to get onto the field and you're facing your opponent down the tilt, everything else becomes quiet. You're, you have a silence about you and you see a target in front of you and if you can smoothly get to there without um, any other distractions, you're going to have a good match. It's a really quiet, almost zen moment to, to have a good run down the tilt. Representing Australia is, is anybody's dream, isn't it? Whatever sport or thing you do. This is like Formula One racing. You know, this is this is this is what this is to me. Formula One racing. Not everybody can do this sort of thing, and to actually represent your country um, is a major honour. It is a global culture. Um, everybody looks after everybody. You go away to an event, and you don't have to solely look after your horse yourself, or you know, try and have one squire look after you. Everybody pitches in and helps everybody out. So it's a fantastic sport that way. We're all friends, we're all mates, um, and uh, I, think, I think I've said it before, you know, you want your best friend to smash the bejesus out of you, um, and you want to smash the bejesus out of him. It's, um, you know, grab your arm, grab your lance, travel to faraway lands, um, you know, make friends and smash them with a big stick.